In this video, we're going to continue examining practice problems from practice exam 2.2 related to chapter 7 on gases in the fall 22 semester. So in this question, number 13, we're asked about the volume of H2 gas produced when 25 grams of zinc reacts with 500 milliliters of one mole per liter hydrochloric acid, according to the balanced chemical equation that you see here, at constant temperature and pressure conditions here that are underlined in red, 22.5 degrees C and 0.955 atmospheres. Okay, so just to pause and think for a second here. At the constant temperature and pressure conditions, volume and number of moles are proportional for an ideal gas. That's Avogadro's law. This means that the volume of a gas is a measure of its quantity or amount in moles. And so in essence, what we're trying to find here, if we take one step back from the volume, is the number of moles of H2 gas produced in this reaction. So it reduces more or less to a stoichiometry problem where we're going to apply the ideal gas law at the end. To get started with this though, the first thing we need to figure out is what is the limiting reactant? And in order to do that, we need the moles of zinc and the moles of hydrochloric acid. And the moles of zinc can be found just by dividing 25 grams by the molar mass of zinc given on the slide. And this is the value we get, about 0.4 moles of zinc. For the HCl, we take the 0.5 liters or 500 milliliters of solution used and multiply by the molarity, one mole per liter, to get 0.5 moles of HCl. Now, this may lead you to believe that zinc is the limiting reactant because it's present in smaller quantity, but be careful. Two moles of HCl are used up for every one mole of H2 produced. So in fact, we can make less H2 from the HCl than we can from the zinc. The limiting reactant here is hydrochloric acid. And if need be, pause the video now and verify that for yourself using molar ratios and figuring out how much H2 we can make from these given quantities of zinc and hydrochloric acid, HCl. All right, we've got HCl as our limiting reactant. That means we're gonna proceed with this number of moles of HCl to figure out the moles of H2 that will be formed in this reaction. And we're using the molar ratio between H2 and HCl here, one H2 produced for every two HCls consumed. This leads us to the conclusion that 0.250 moles of H2 will be produced in this reaction. And all that's left now is to figure out what volume that corresponds to under the conditions underlined in red, 22.5 degrees Celsius and 0.955 atmospheres. So what we're gonna do is take the ideal gas law, PV equals nRT, and rearrange to solve for volume. And in doing that, we arrive at this equation here, and we can go ahead and plug everything on in. We're using 0.08206 liter atmospheres per Kelvin mole, to ensure that things divide out nicely. Atmospheres divide out with atmospheres, moles with moles, and Kelvin with Kelvin. And we arrive at a final volume of 6.35 liters at the end of this. So in essence, a gas stoichiometry problem where we're applying stoichiometry things we're already familiar with and using the ideal gas law to go from moles to another quantity of interest for gases, volume. In this problem, we're asked about two samples of gas, a sample of krypton at 345 Kelvin, representing that in red, and a sample of Br2 gas at some unknown temperature, and we're trying to find that temperature. And the temperature we're targeting here is the temperature at which the bromine gas, the Br2 molecules, have the same root mean square speed as the root mean square speed of the gas particles in the krypton sample at 345 Kelvin. So this is, a, this is a question that's gonna draw on our understanding and facility with the kinetic molecular theory and some of the equations underlying that theory, particularly the root mean square speed or velocity. All right, so let's think a little bit about root mean square velocity. Root mean square velocity is related to the temperature and the molar mass of a gas. The higher the temperature, the faster the particles move. The greater the molar mass, the slower the particles move. And the way this shakes out mathematically is that the root mean square speed is equal to the square root of 3R, R being the ideal gas constant, times the temperature in Kelvin divided by the molar mass. Now another way we could say this is that the root mean square speed is directly proportional to the square root of 
the temperature divided by the molar mass. And these are the two key variables in this problem. We've got the temperature in the form of 345 Kelvin and the unknown temperature of the bromine sample. And we've got the molar masses, which are also known indirectly from the periodic table. So for example, Krypton here has a molar mass of 83.8 grams per mole. Or you could think about it as AMU for the individual atoms. And Br2 has a molar mass of 159.8 grams per mole. So now that we've kind of laid out the foundations here, it's a good moment to pause and think about whether we expect the bromine's temperature to be higher or lower than the temperature of the krypton. Well, Br2 is heavier than krypton. And so in order for the molecules to be moving at the same speed, the temperature is going to need to be quite a bit higher in the case of the bromine sample relative to the krypton sample. And so I think it's helpful here conceptually to remind ourselves that the temperature of the Br2 sample is going to have to be quite a bit greater than the temperature of the krypton sample in order to make this work. And we can proceed with solving the problem mathematically by essentially setting the two root mean square speeds equal to each other. And I'm going to start by doing that in a very simple way by saying VRMS for Br2 is equal to VRMS for the krypton. And what I'm going to do now is just replace each VRMS term with its respective square root of 3RT over M expression, but recognizing that I can actually divide out 3R on both sides of this ensuing equation because 3 and R are, are constants, right? And so I can say, for instance, on the right-hand side where everything is known, of the root mean square speed is proportional to the temperature, 345 Kelvin, divided by the molar mass, 83.8 grams per mole. And on the left-hand side, I'll have a similar expression with the temperature unknown in the numerator, let's call that TBR2, and in the denominator, I'll have that molar mass, 159.8 grams per mole. So now I've got an equation with only one unknown remaining, that temperature of Br2, and I can solve for it by, for example, squaring both sides, cross multiplying, and isolating TBR2. And this comes out to 658 Kelvin. And this jives with the intuition that we had earlier that the temperature of the bromine is going to have to be quite a bit greater than the temperature of the krypton because bromine gas, Br2 gas, is quite a bit heavier than krypton gas. And notice as well that this end up, ended up being a pretty simple proportionality problem since with the square roots gone, we see that the ratio of temperature to molar mass is the same in both gases when they have the same root mean square speed. This problem is all about effusion, and we're asked to select which statements are true. In all statements, assume that the moles of gas and pressures are equal. So if we're ever comparing two gases, we're going to assume that the moles of gas and their pressures are equal, these two variables potentially affecting effusion. We want to sort of take them off the table. All right, so let's go through each statement one by one and decide whether it's true or false. Okay, it takes O2 longer to effuse to the same extent as HE at the same temperature. Now, we could look up molar masses to verify this or just think about it intuitively. O2 is quite a bit heavier than helium. What does that mean for effusion? Well, effusion is generally slower for heavier gases at the same temperature because the heavier gas is moving more slow right? Smaller root mean square speed, for example. And so this is absolutely true. It takes O2 longer to effuse than helium when both gases are at the same temperature. Second statement, neon at 325 Kelvin fuses faster than neon at 275 Kelvin. Well, this, again, is absolutely true because neon at 325 Kelvin has a greater root mean square speed, gas particles are moving faster, and will thus effuse more rapidly. At the same temperature, F2 effuses faster than neon. Well, again, if we think about heavier versus lighter, F2 is quite a bit heavier than neon. Neon is, is quite a bit lighter. Note that here. Neon gas is quite a bit lighter 
than F2 gas. And so quite the opposite is true. Neon will effuse faster than F2. So this statement is false. It's backwards. What about F2 versus Krypton? Well, these molar masses you can get from the periodic table, I'll just go ahead and tell you, F2 is about 38 grams per mole, and Krypton is way up at 84 grams per mole, and so F2 is absolutely going to effuse faster than the much heavier Krypton. Let's go ahead and note that. Krypton is quite a bit heavier than F2 and will effuse more slowly as a result. And then the last item here asks about helium and F2. Now, helium is quite a bit lighter than F2, and so it will effuse more rapidly and take less time to effuse than F2. So this statement is, in fact, false. It takes HE quite a bit less time to effuse to the same extent as F2. So the big message here is all about the dependence of effusion rate and the time required for effusion on temperature and molar mass for a gas when the moles and pressure of the gas are held constant.